Good morning. This is Alana Mueller with Kaufman Fast Track. Welcome to the now November edition of the Kaufman Fast Track Author Series. It's my pleasure to have you with us this morning. Uh, if you will, please join me in welcoming Bill Matthews and Dave Sullivan to the Kaufman Fast Track Author Series. Uh, Bill and Dave are a little different than past presenters. Uh, each has his own consulting company and collaborates regularly on strategy and board governance. They've worked together for over 20 years and co-founded Aileron, a nonprofit operating foundation located in Dayton, Ohio, that has worked with more than 5,000 second stage privately held businesses from across the United States since its inception in 1996. Both are past CEOs. Bill came from the private sector and Dave from the public and multinational businesses. Uh, on a personal note, I personally utilize their continuous planning model and it's my pleasure to introduce the Fast Track community to Bill and Dave. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, well, I, and well, I want to thank you first uh, for hosting this event. And I also want to pass along my thanks to Dave uh, for uh, taking this one on today since I'm having some issues with my voice. Before I turn it over to Dave, I do want to make two points about the 5P model that I think everybody needs to know before they start. First, uh, it's not just that each wild company implemented these 5Ps but they actually did it in a step-by-step -step logical sequence. In other words, they implemented the first P before the second, the second P before the third, and so on. And secondly, they viewed it as a continuous, repetitive process. So when they completed each cycle, they started over again with the first P because the business environment never stops changing. So as you listen to today's presentation, Try to keep in mind that this is a step-by-step, -step, sequential, and repeatable process. Dave, I'll let you take it from here. Okay, good morning and uh, welcome. Let me, uh, let me begin by some, uh, first of all, some technical speak. Uh, we have, uh, we, as we first look at companies, we look at them from a very technical perspective. So I'll put the four keywords up here. Uh, we see ouch businesses, ho-hum, gee whiz, and wow. This is something we've come up with with all of our years of experience running corporations. Uh, but let me, uh, let me put some definition around each one of these if I can. The Ouch business is a company that is in business, but they've sort of lost control. Uh, they're both personally and professionally disconnected. Uh, as Alana mentioned at the beginning, we have worked probably with 5,000 companies. And unfortunately, I will say that a lot of the companies I've seen over my career are sort of trapped in this mode. Uh, They've got a company, uh, it's not good enough to close, it's not good enough to sell. And, and the result is they've, they've kind of set themselves to operating. And we're saying, okay, there is hope for this, you can get out of this phase. We also see ho-hum businesses. These are companies that they do well when the market does well. Uh, you know, if things are going well and things are up, they're up. Uh, if things are declining, they tend to decline. The gee whiz companies are a lot of the companies we run across. They're, uh, they're pretty well managed. Uh, they do some things very well. But over time, as results are good, they tend to pay more attention to their financials, which we think is one of the worst tools in the world for managing a company because a financial is an autopsy report. All it tells you really is how good your decisions were over the past 6 to 12 months. So they get comfortable because the numbers look good. And as soon as you become comfortable, you become vulnerable to competition. So one of the things we're trying to do with these companies especially is move them to that next phase of being what we call a wow business. You're never comfortable. Uh, you're, you're managing your company, keeping everything in control. And as Bill talked about, the five Ps kind of connect to a 23-step process. Uh, down at the bottom right corner of that slide I have up, you're going to see what it looks like uh, two arrows in a, in a racetrack configuration. I'll be walking around this racetrack a little bit today in this presentation and, and showing you exactly what we mean by a wild business. So what first is a wild business? <clears throat> it's got a clear purpose, and we're going to talk about that a little more. It tends to focus outwardly and forward as opposed to inwardly and backward. Uh, they're clear on what they stand for, and they have a plan of attack. And then they align their organization to deliver that attack. Uh, and when, in so doing, what they do is, and notice the two words are they lead people, they don't manage people, and they manage process. And more importantly, from our experience, what we see with the wow businesses is they have a very flawless and very rhythmic execution of how they uh, go forward. 
Let me give you some biases or fundamentals uh, as we go forward. First, we think a WOW company or a well-managed business knows what it intends to achieve, first and foremost. Secondly, they know what they do well and they know why it matters to those they serve. Third, they have, uh, they're not only looking at what's in front of them at the moment, but they're looking down the road to see how to position their companies for long-term viability. They always employ the very best people. We're going to spend some time on this as we go forward. And they minimize surprises. I mean, obviously, we're all going to be surprised by events such as recessions or changes in the environment. But people tend to learn how to minimize these surprises and manage their companies regardless of the environment. <clears throat> One of the comments I always made is, if you're in business, there's really no such thing as a recession. Uh, there's just a different operating environment. Uh, there was a, uh, a famous economist who once said the only purpose of economic forecasting is to make meteorologists feel better about their profession. And I, and I think they're right. So we shouldn't spend too much time paying attention to what the media says. We should be paying a lot of attention to what operating environment we're living in and making sure we manage our companies to the very best of our ability in those environments. Let me talk about the, the various P's. Bill introduced the fact that there are five major parts of the system. And you're going to see down in the bottom right corner as we get to the racetrack at the end of this, we'll show you that this really covers the first 10 steps. Uh, we believe first and foremost that planning is the driver of success. And we're going to talk about planning from two perspectives. First is you, the individual. Uh, I'm a strategic planning consultant by background, and one of the things I often run across is business owners who don't have a clue of what's important to them or what they want to deliver. And as they begin to build their organizations and bring people in, they can't, they can't mix with the right people. They can't articulate their passion to the right people. And as a result, they get themselves bound up. So we always go back and saying, if, whether you're in business or planning to start a business, it should begin with you. Uh, what matters to you, what are your beliefs and attitudes, your value system, and really what is it you want to do over your life? Uh, Bill and I have uh, been a, had some pretty long careers and we've always said there's kind of three phases to your business life. Uh, the first phase is figuring out what you want to do. Uh, the second phase really is figuring out how to create wealth. And wealth can be defined as money or control of your time or control of your agenda. And then the third phase really is uh, trying to figure out what to do with the wealth you've created. So learning what you want to do, doing it well, and then figuring out how to give it back. That all ties to your personal value, your personal goals and timetables. And then last but not least, once you're clear on that, then you can articulate the outcome to your shareholders. And so there's two parts here. There's the personal vision and there's the organizational vision. What you want to do and what you want your business to accomplish, and you want to keep those in sync. And we know that when that happens, that you find out that you do a great job on establishing your strategy and operating plans to operate the business and deliver the outcome you desire. So let's talk a little bit about planning. What is it? Uh, I'll give you a couple of definitions here. One, it's a decision-making process. How do I spend the time, the people, and the money I have wisely to accomplish a goal that I have in mind? That's really all there is to strategic planning. Any planning process will work if you will just believe in it and stick to it. Secondly, planning requires you to take a look today at where you think your world is going, not where it is at the moment, but where you think it's going to go over two, three, or five years, and then making decisions because you have some confidence in your research and, and, and the things you've done to know that you're going to make sound decisions that give you a chance to deliver the outcome. And I, I, will not, uh, I will not kid you, it's not easy. It is simple, but it's not easy. You've got to do some research. And what I've found is good plans start with good information. So we could talk about an elaborate planning model, but I've, uh, we, Bill and I have worked for years uh, coming off a version of Peter Drucker's theory of the business model. And as you know, Peter Drucker was one of the all-time management gurus. But he said if, it's, if you really look at a plan, Plan. It's as simple as doing three things. First and foremost, where's the world going in which you operate? Uh, what is the reality you will be operating against? And I looked at a lot of business plans. I looked at a lot of strategic plans. And a lot of times they have nothing to do with reality. Uh, 
most companies, mine included and any company I've ever run over my career, has not been strong enough to own reality. We just could operate within reality. So the first question is how do you define it? What's it look like going forward? Once you know that, then you can focus your idea or your business against that reality. How do I succeed in that marketplace? And then third, I can look then and it'll tell me what my skills and competencies or the processes I need to put in place to make sure I do well. So simply said, reality is whatever it's going to be. It's going wherever it wants to go. And your success depends on your ability to focus your enterprise in that reality. And that tells you of all the processes, skills, and people you need in order to pull it off. <clears throat> the example that Drucker gave was General Motors. He made the comment that if you think about General Motors, for a 70-year period, every quarter, they did better than the prior quarter. Why? Because for a period of time, they were clear on what the people wanted to pay for. The reality was, what is it I want to do? They built a company that supplied that reality, and they aligned the skills and competencies. Where this model will come off the rails on occasion is while we can define reality based on a moving target, what we tend to do is lock in to how we do things and lock in to the tools we have. And when we do that, there often is a disconnect between reality and our focus and our skills. So the point Drucker made is you've got to keep these three uh, cars of the train connected to make sure you're going where you need to go. So let me just kind of put planning in a nutshell here and, and separate the definition of planning for strategy. And I'm going to start with what I believe are the two most important things you can do for any business. First and foremost, understand what you want to achieve, which is vision, the outcome that you're in business to achieve or you want to be in business to achieve. Then understand what you do for a living, your mission, what you do, the products you offer, the customers you serve, the needs you meet. But if you want to think strategically, you start with the end in mind and you come back to the present. That is strategic thinking. If you go the other way, starting with what you do and trying to get better at it, that's the definition of continuous improvement. Uh, and I'll give you a company example here of somebody that does really great at improving themselves year over year, and that would be Blockbuster. There is nobody who does what Blockbuster does better than Blockbuster does it. The problem is, who cares? Because what came up now is you and I, the users of entertainment, told Blockbuster we wanted it delivered in a different fashion, and they chose to ignore us and run their businesses the way they currently run them. Continuous improvement gets you better at what you do, but it doesn't guarantee you'll ever achieve your vision. And as a matter of fact, I can tell you over my 30 or 40 year career that I've never seen a company achieve its vision by only getting better at what it does because planning now comes into play. Planning is that process that moves all over the place based on environmental changes, based on competitive changes, based on different wants and needs of your customer. But what businesses can never lose sight of is what they want to achieve and the products and services they want to be involved in in order to get there. You can always get better, you can always change, but you've got to make sure that you understand what the customer is truly willing to pay for. Let me give you my uh, 20 years of planning experience of why plans don't work. Uh, number one is the CEO is not committed. Uh, he or she will stop the company uh, once a year and crank out a budget. Uh, that is not planning. There's no commitment to positioning of an enterprise. Uh, it's just doing a budget. Second one, wrong people in key positions. Uh, I came out of big corporations. That the last one I ran had 2,600 people. Uh, with a lot of bodies, you can push a rock up a mountain. Uh, but the smaller businesses, especially startup ventures or new ventures, you can never afford to have mediocre people in key positions. And let me be very blunt about this. Most of the mediocre companies I run across have a lot of people with the same last name involved in the company. Family businesses are, tend to employ family members. Uh, you can love them, but if they're not competent, you shouldn't employ them. Third, you ignore reality, as we talked about a minute ago. Fourth, you have too many goals or activities, meaning no focus. And then the people who are supposed to implement the plan never got involved in creating it. What are the other reasons? 
current business not in control. So if your current business isn't, isn't up and running, coming up with a bigger version of it is not going to be particularly helpful. Secondly, crises intervene on a regular basis. We know that. There are going to be fires to fight, problems to solve, but that's not why you're in business. So solve those, resolve those, and get back on path. A non-reviewed plan is a plan that dies. It makes it a living, breathing, it tends to die on a shelf. And what we're guaranteeing you is a reviewed plan probably doubles your chance of a successful implementation. People not being held accountable for outcomes. Uh, too much is, gee, they really did a good job, they worked hard, however, they didn't accomplish anything. We're big on following results and outcomes, not activities and time spent. And then last but not least, inadequate resources available. And an example I always give here is, you know, mama opens up her famous Italian restaurant, she has people lined up around the block. She's so successful, she decides to op open a second restaurant on the other side of town. And when she does that, she realizes she was short on time, people, and money, and both restaurants will tend to fail because she can't be in two places at one time. So this is our 20-plus years of experience of looking at why plans haven't made it. These are probably the key reasons and the key concerns you should have in mind. Let's move on to the second P, and that's all about the people. And I will put this Alfred S. Chandler quote. This is a classic quote from business. And it basically says that you figure out what you want your business to do, and then you employ your people in order to make it happen. And so we've always used the structure follow strategy model. So let's first and foremost talk about people. And this is what is in the WOW book and in the WOW process. First and foremost, the right person with the right skills who can operate in the right structure. And that's culture. We're going to talk a little more about culture as we go forward. Next, you look for those who fit. Uh, I've had some incredibly talented people working for me that became disasters because they cause more harm than they cause good while they're working with us. So they need to fit the culture of enterprise and what you're trying to do and accomplish. Most of us have businesses. I came out of manufacturing. I came out of chemicals. Most of us have companies where it's more important to have the right attitude than the right skills. We can develop them. I did have a few key jobs where I expected the right credential, but most of the jobs of my enterprise, we could train the skills necessary if the individual fit our business model. If the attitude was wrong, most people are fully baked by about the time they're 18 years of age, and we didn't do a very good job of changing them. We could modify their behavior temporarily, but at some point in time, the wrong attitude always came back to haunt us. One of our mantras has always been, take your time, hire slowly, and when you know you got the wrong person, terminate them rapidly. Uh, both Bill and I can tell you we probably did not do that well enough over our careers. There, there were people that we stuck with way too long when we should have probably, for their benefit as well as ours, made quicker decisions and moved more rapidly. Now, that hire slowly one is difficult, because if, if you don't have somebody in a key position, the work is on your desk, and we know that. And we know that you will take some time to look for that person, but eventually the next person that can walk in the door and do something, you'll eventually hire. And we, and we tell you to resist the urge to do that. Take your time. Find other ways to get the work done, whether you go to contractors or you partner with somebody, but find the ways to get the work done. Don't put the wrong person in the key job. And my final point on that is never settle. Never settle for anyone. I'll put a number on it. I had a, uh, I employed a wrong CFO. We knew that person was wrong. Credentials were right, but the person didn't fit us. Nobody really liked this person. Nobody thought this person could make it happen. But they were local, and they knew our industry, so we made the dumbest decision of our lives, and we hired this person. Well, if I go back and do some math on this, uh, a month later, we realized we had the wrong person, so then we began, the, and in a large company, they had contracts, so we began the process of terminating this individual, which took a few months to do it properly and legally. Then we had to re-recruit to get the second person in, and that period of time took us almost nine months to get the right person in the right job. 
between actual out-of-pocket costs of recruiting and termination and re-recruiting and then adding opportunity costs, we figured this bad decision probably cost us $900,000. And so we're suggesting to people don't settle. Uh, there is a, there's not only a, a financial reason, but there's a fit reason. And the damage that person did while they were in the company was uh, something that took us quite a while to reverse. So as you, as you build organizations, regardless of the stage you're in, if you're, whether you're starting up, uh, whether you're building a technology company, whether you're coming forward with the, you know, the next steps, or you're in a high growth mode, first thing you want to do is <clears throat> look at whatever structure you've got in place. And if you're an entrepreneur, it may be you. And then look at how well you're doing. If you have an organization, look at the jobs they're doing and look at it versus the performance you're seeing in the company. Then lay your plan on top of that. So, okay, if this is where we're going, do the people we have have the ability to get there? If not, can we de develop them? Uh, do we have to add additional people to the company? Do we have to change our functional organization so it works well? And what you're doing is identifying gaps. Where you want to go and the competency of your people is a gap. And so you're saying, okay, now, and that, by the way, that would be you if you're the owner. And so you're saying, all right, let's me think about what I would have to do to get to that next level or what my people will have to do to get to that next level. And so you identify gaps, then you have an, an employee development program if you can pull that off, if they have the capability to get there. If not, you're now in the process of recruiting new talent or better talent, talent you need to deliver the outcome. And then you revise your organization structure to make sure the plan can be implemented successfully. Structure follows strategy is the way to make it. Let me focus in on that people development piece, though, for a second. I get asked on a regular basis, well, whose job is it? And I always point out that it's everybody's job. Uh, as the leader of an enterprise or a leader of a function, your job is to provide an environment where the people who are there want to be there and want to grow. Then it's creating the resources, whether it's training programs, such as available through Fast Track, Whatever you need to do to get the resources in front of people so they can develop to the level you need. And then you have the responsibility to provide feedback during this developmental process. Just sending someone to training or giving them a development plan is not good enough. There's got to be a review and feedback process that defines whether they do or do not deliver. And what's the job of the employee? I've always said you have a right as an employee to not be promoted. You do not have the right to not grow. And so the employee has to recognize the company is going somewhere, and that employee's role is to develop at least at the pace of the company and grow with the company to ensure that there is success not only for the individual, but for the people who put their capital at risk to put a business in place. Leadership facts. Uh, something that I've learned over the years the hard way. I, I was a CEO for three different companies. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a lot I mentioned at the beginning. They were all public companies, two of them which were multinational. Uh, one of the things I learned that off the clock, uh, everything you do is observed and interpreted. And, and let me give you a story on myself. Uh, in my headquarters here in Denver, Colorado, where I live, uh, I was walking down my hall going to the parking garage. And in order to get there, I had to walk through one of our subsidiary companies. And as I walked down the hall, I could always look in office windows, and I could see desks. Well, one of the desks I saw was just piled up with paper. It was just you know, a mess. I happen to be somewhat of a neat freak. So in a fit of good humor, going home one Friday afternoon, I walked into that office, and I wrote a little note and stuck it in the middle of the pile. And I wrote the note, and the note said, let me know when you find this and I signed it and I dated it and then I laughed all the way to my car. I was the CEO of the holding company. I had walked through the, another corporation and I had walked into an administrative assistance office. I didn't know whose office I was walking into. Bottom line was this, as I was confirmed to be an ogre as a leader of my enterprise, I was accused of breaking and entering and rifling through people's personal products. What's my point? Everything you do is observed and interpreted. You're never off the clock, and I shouldn't have done what I had done. 
I spent a lot of time apologizing to people to let them know that I had been in a good mood and I should have thought before I acted. Everything you do is observed and interpreted. And this, this goes hand in hand with the next point. Based on that story I just told you, I can't control what happens. People thought what they thought and it, it caused me difficulty. Third, every interaction within an organization sends a message, either by design or by default. I certainly sent one by default. It was not my intent, but I did it. And let me give you the one that we spend a lot of time talking to business owners about at Aileron, and that is just because you own the place, it doesn't give you the right to run it if you're not that kind of it just gives you the right to own it. So we hammer a lot at CEOs and business owners about the importance of having competency at every level of the organization to include themselves, to ensure the business delivers the defined and desired outcome. And that leads back to the cultural fit of everything that goes on in a business. Everything we talk about tends to have a cultural impact. And what's culture? The way things get done in your place. Uh, it's, it, you could give you a very sophisticated uh, definition, but at the end of the day, it's how we do things around here. And that's the best definition I've ever heard of culture. Uh, and it's coming first and foremost from the leadership. Uh, whatever position you're in, if you have employees, they interpret you, as I said earlier, and they watch your behavior, not your words. What is it you actually do? Uh, if you have your values stated and you don't live them, they notice that right away. So they're paying more attention to how you act and behave and less attention to what you say and write. We have found that it's a competitive advantage. It's a sustainable competitive advantage to have a better culture because many times your competitors can copy your products, they can copy your services, they can copy your business model, but if you've got a great culture, that's pretty tough to copy. And that gives you a sustainable competitive advantage. And it's a managed process. Uh, you don't want culture happening to you. Uh, more often than not, when it does happen to you, it goes the direction you don't want. And I can tell you from experience, it's very difficult to change a culture. We'll even give you a rule of thumb. If you're trying to make a cultural shift within an organization, you can figure one year for every level you have. So if you have a three-level organization or a four-level organization, don't be surprised if it's going to take you three or four years to get buy-in to a positive future. So this down here is one of my partners, uh, Dr. Ginsberg. Uh, he talks about understanding culture, and it kind of gives you a visual model of what I just talked about. It starts with your beliefs, your values, your morals, your ethics, and those are translated by your actual behavior. But the difficulty is that it's not still good enough because there's two views of the world. There's behavior as perceived by you, and you're thinking that you're sending a clear message and you're very consistent, but there's a behavior as received by others. And so what happens here often is you get a gap. And this is where the job comes in, managing the gap. You want that gap narrowing, not growing. And if the gap is not narrowing, then you've got to go back and say, what am I doing that gets people confused? What am I showing that, that, that doesn't allow for consistent thinking about how we really want to do things around here? And so I, I encourage people on a regular basis, keep evaluating your message and how your message is being heard. And you do that by asking people. Make sure, though, that you're clear on the fact that that gap can't get wider because you end up getting that culture by the fall. We're talking everything about people as getting an effective organization together so that your plan can be developed. So first and foremost, flexibility, adaptability, and creatability. I said at the very beginning, reality is going wherever it wants, and so you're going to have to be fleet of foot and flexible to handle the changes being made. You want the people who work with you and for you and above you to buy into what must be done, not just comply. You want them to really believe we stand for something and we're going to make this happen. You want them to believe they have a responsibility to the business, that they count as much as the company does, they don't just have a job. And you expect them to do what they say they will do. That's the commitment and the accountability piece, and that they're going to do it on time. And if they can do that, then there's no fear of being held accountable for results, because technically the individual within the organization has now got the best form of control, which is...
You go to the third P. And this is in the book talks about the processes. We've already now put a plan in place. We've thought, thought through who the right people are. And now what we want to do is make sure we have the process working that supports the business outcome we have in mind. So let me step back a minute and tell you what I see when I walk into companies or when we teach our seminars for Aileron. Too often we find the problems that are, that are stated on this slide. There's no defined outcome. It seems like everything we do is important. Everything we do is worthwhile. We're not sure who has what authority. That's the clarity of a business. Priorities are blurred. Uh, things overlap. It's not clear on what this business exists for. Uh, too many people doing the same job, duplication of effort, checkers checking what the checkers have already checked. And I see this on a regular basis when I look at business process. It's a lack of trust, so I will let you do the work, but then I'm going to make sure the work was done the way I would have done it. And then accepting less than expected performance. Uh, to me, we'll, we'll talk about expectations in planning. We talk about objectives in planning. I've always looked at that as a contract. If I'm the, the su supervisor, I provide you the resources because you gave me the commitment to achieve an outcome. And I kind of look at that as a contractual agreement. So if the conditions are good and the resources are provided, I'm not going to accept you getting close to an outcome. My expectation is you'll deliver the outcome we all had in mind. And then the last one, because there's no defined outcome, there's a lack of clarity, organizations tend to be very slow in making their decisions. So as we talk about the wow processes, the things we're recommending and you'll see in, in Bill's book, first and foremost, the, the plan is there and your processes are in alignment with the delivery of the plan. They're clear. They're few in number and they're clear and they're well documented. They're so clear that they're seldom, if ever, if, and I like to say never, interpreted. And they're repeatable. And that's, as Bill said at the beginning, this racetrack, this 23 steps that are part of the five P's, that's a repeatable process. The more you do it, the faster you do it, the better you do it, the better control you have. They're followed. When you put the right process in place, they're not things people try to get around. They're things people want to do because it simplifies the work of the enterprise. They're tied to people's jobs. People know that what they do has a direct impact, and that direct impact is often felt through compensation and felt through incentive compensation. And they should be helping you drive your training and development for the individuals who work within your organization. So, you know, connecting the pieces here, planning, followed by the right people, we have the right tools to pull the job off. So when you get into this control process, you're looking at performance standards. And I like the term mutually agreed to performance standards between the supervisor and the, and the employee to say, look, what is it we want to do and what should we both be willing to be held accountable for? Then consistently monitoring and measuring performance against those standards. And when you're starting to come off the rails or you're starting to see difficulty, taking the appropriate action. And then I'm a big believer in reward and recognition, both good and bad. Uh, certainly we do a good job in most organizations of giving people something for something they did well, but we don't necessarily do well on the consequences of non-performance. There should be consequences. There should be a letter. There should be a corrective action plan. And at some point in time, if people aren't delivering it, there should be a replacement of that individual. So let me go on now talking about the fourth P, and that's perform, perform metrics. It's a word that Bill created. I'm still having a hard time pronouncing it. It's perform metrics, but in fact, it's the, the metrics you put in place to minimize surprises to show you what you're doing. And one of my favorite quotes up here is that things that get measured are things that get Let's talk about those things. There are things that go to the outcomes to be delivered not the activities. I don't care how much time you're spending if you're not accomplishing anything. I want to see what you're actually getting done that ties to our plan and to ties to the success of the enterprise. I want to be able to monitor performance versus plan. I want to see real numbers, quantified results. I don't like a lot of soft measures as a bias. I want to see a lot of things being done and done well. I want to see that we're in front of the business. We're not reacting to it. One of the things I witnessed between 2008 and 2011 uh, at our aileron group was about 
that's the majority of the businesses dropped by 35 uh, percent during the recession. And that's because they weren't paying attention. Uh, and I remember giving a speech to him one time and saying, you know what, you deserve exactly what you got. Because you all saw trends in your organizations, in your industries. And one of the ones that, out in of Dayton, Ohio, where aileron exists, we have a lot of tool and die and automotive companies. The automotive sector has been slowing for quite a while. You've got time to adjust your business. You've got time to anticipate orders are going to fall out. But what happened was they kept looking at their financials, and they were not paying attention to the trends that were going to drive their future financials. The trends were telling them to slow down. The trends were telling them to resize their organization, yet they were ignoring that. They were reacting to it after it hit them. And so when they were off 35%, uh, many businesses failed, many businesses did you know, aggressive layoffs, but they had an opportunity to be ready for it because that recession had started in 2007, not 2008. And last but not least, you want to link the empowerment, that, that freedom to act, that freedom to, to get the job done, but you want that freedom to tie to an outcome. So empowering the individual, as we talked about before, giving them the, the chance to do well, but making sure they're willing to accept the accountability to perform for the business. Uh, what are examples of Performmetrics? Uh, job descriptions certainly are. Uh, you can create executive dashboards or dashboards from wherever you are in your organization using the balanced scorecard, the activity-based accounting system. Uh, McKinsey has a 7S structure, a McKinsey consulting company that allows you to look at strategy and structure and, and things you do. Uh, if you're ISO certified or looking for ISO, that documents your business process and you can put action plans together in your plan. My point is, it doesn't matter. You just pick one or two that make sense to you but use them consistently to improve the outcome of your business. Let me move on to the fifth P. And this one is uh, kind of a, an um, overarching umbrella. Even though we call it the fifth P, it's involved in all of the, of the 23 steps. Passion. And let me put something out that I think says it well. And that is passion when it's connected to vision or strategy. When you bring these two together, anything is possible. When you got the right people in the right place with the right outcome in mind working to deliver that incredible thing to occur. We know that this is the primary driver of wild businesses. We got passionate leaders in there. And we'll define that leadership in a minute, but they're passionate about the outcome. They're passionate about how they're attacking what they do. They're passionate about coming to work. And it comes right out of them and that personal vision they have. And it comes out of their values. And when they, when they really lead like this, they create purpose for everybody in the organization. And the excitement level goes up, and the pace of play picks up. People are anxious to get at it. People are anxious to make things occur. And it, it's excitement. But there's another word I throw in here. It gives you courage to move forward in advance of the need. It gives you courage to anticipate, not just to react. And we find that the wild businesses are courageous, excited, and passionate about what to do. So I'm going to give you two slides here. One is getting to a wild level in passion, and the other one will be staying at the wild level. What we find in passionate leadership, servant leaders. Uh, they look to the needs of the people first. Uh, probably one of the best examples I can give of that was Herman Miller. Uh, if you ever get a chance to read his book, Leadership is an Art, or leadership jazz, and what he says very clearly in that is that his job was to provide the right environment for his organization to perform, provide the right resources for them to do it, and to say thank you for the results they created. He never felt a need to take credit. He was humble, but he was confident that the company could run. He was calm, yet assertive. It was a performance-based organization, and he was very courageous because he let go to very skilled people, and that improved the control. The hardest thing we have to get across to our business owners at Aileron, who are generally second stage companies, is a better form of control is letting go, not holding on. The more you personally hold on, the less is possible because you're the only thinker in your own enterprise. Courageous is letting go to competent people and, and knowing that the, the results will happen. 
Passionate leaders are dedicated to being the very best at what they do. They are committed to the success of the business. And there's just that word I keep putting out there is a commitment. They're not trying, they're committed to an outcome, and they recognize that they may have flaws and they seek help. And the, the help they often get, and one of the things we spend a lot of time on, is creating boards of advisors or boards of directors for privately held companies. Uh, I would tell you that somebody asked me the other day, when is the right time to put a board of advisors together? And my answer was kind of shocking to the end of the start. Uh, because number one, you can't afford to employ anybody, but you need help, you need advice, and you need counsel. So get together some trusted advisors, that does not say friends, or family, or fools, and it's trusted advisors, people who will tell you the truth about your ideas, your concepts, your business, and help you come to a better direction and a better understanding of what they can do. Staying at WOW, you surround yourself with the very best, hopefully better than you. The better your organization, the better it performs. I just talked a little bit about outside counsel. Uh, we are passionate about boards. I think between Bill and myself, through Aileron, we've probably set up over 600 boards of, of advisors or directors for privately held companies. They work. Uh, they are a, a level of talent you couldn't afford to pay for. These are people that were there for you do not have a horse in the race, are not going to try to lead you anywhere, they're not paid, they're usually getting some form of an honorarium, but it is not enough to make them lead you somewhere. They are there strictly for you first and then ensure that your business works. And what that requires is for you to be an active listener, whether you're listening to an outside board or whether you're listening to ideas coming from within your organization. None of us have all the answers. Uh, none of us have all the of, of the success stories. We need to listen to others, work with others, and gain as much as possible. Passionate leaders also know that it's not a one-time. It's a it's a destination, not not a destination. It's a journey. Uh, I'll give you a, a quick example. On my board of directors, I had a man named Jean Carlson of SAS Airlines. Uh, he did a great job at one point in time of building the best business travelers airline. He thought that was a destination. He did everything it took to be better than anyone else, and then he stopped. And at that point, every other airline who had lost business to him began to realize, we've got to be that or better. Uh, they became better, and it cost you on his job. So it's not a one-time journey. It's, a, it's an ongoing journey. Once he said he wanted to be the best, it was a moving bar. He should have kept moving. And then I'll give you with two other points. Continue to learn and grow. Uh, you're never done. You never have all the answers. And just because you have the job doesn't mean you have the skill. And that's what I tell a lot of business owners. You need to know when it's time to step aside. And you don't have to be a business owner. Learn when to step aside in any job you have that you're no longer adding value to or is no longer adding value to your company. And so what you're seeing now, the final slide, is the 23 steps. And uh, difficult to read, but certainly in the back of Bill's book. But there the five P's are covered. The first ten steps are planning. The next four or five steps are people. We get into talking to one step of process. We get into talking about the last step of metrics, And the fifth step was passion. But it all begins with you and your dream. What is it you want to do and how do you want to do it? Then you're never done. Continually reassess, revise, and repeat the path and move closer to WOW status with each cycle. We can tell you from experience and from the companies we see who are there, it's really worth it, personally, professionally, and financially. So with that, I, I thank you very much for uh, listening to us, and I will turn it back over to Alana uh, to, to close it out. Thank you well, very much. Well, thank you, Dave. Got great information, very, very useful. Um, for the next few minutes, I invite our listeners to join us for a conversation. Uh, please, uh, if you have a question, type it into your question box on your GoToWebinar dashboard. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, I, I do have a question. You know, my, my, as you know, and you and I have talked about this before, um, one of the things that I just really, really love is just the, the, the premise of continuous, continuous, strat uh, continuous planning. 
Uh, my personal feeling is that with a strategic plan, what often happens is you write this very thick document and then it goes up on a shelf and as you describe, it's never reviewed. And so the, the idea that a strategic plan can be evergreen and still be implemented uh, and, and you, you update it based on the current reality for your business is just really fascinating to me. Can you talk a little bit more about that and, and what an appropriate cycle time is? So what, what's the appropriate uh, time between <coughs> revisions or between reviews, if you will? Bill, why don't you take that start? Um, I think the cycle time really depends upon the industry. I mean, if you have an industry that is moving very quickly, uh, you may have to do planning. Uh, you know, a cycle might be one year. Uh, if you're in the pharmaceuticals business or something that's much longer term, uh, it might be much, much longer than that. So I think it depends upon how quickly the market changes. I mean, the, in, the entire premise of planning as a perpetual process is that it needs to be done really according to a schedule dictated by how quickly the environment changes your competition, etc. So that's a quick answer. Great. Yeah, I know. I, I mean, can I, let me pipe in too if I could. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dave. Let me get pipe in on this too. There is a, uh, there, is a uh, there are four plans out there. Uh, the first one is a strategic plan. That, that has a long-term life that should be looked at regularly based on how your environment changes, as Bill mentioned. There's a second plan, though, that businesses don't often spend time looking at, and that's the business plan. And the business plan is a form of strategic planning, but it says I'm at a fork in the road, and I have limited resources, and I don't know where to spend them. And so people need to think about that. Okay, what's, how do I make my best choice? The, the third plan is the operational plan, is how do I operate this year? And then the fourth one that people spend the most amount of time on is the budget. And I'm going to tell you that is not a plan. That is strictly math. Uh, a budget does nothing more other than cost out your decisions and see if you have the resources to play in that space. So what I watch happen too often is people look at the money they have and figure out what they're going to do with it. When they need to figure out as a player what does it take to play in this industry, what will it cost, and then you evaluate whether you have the money or not. And Bill is absolutely right. That time frame could vary from one year to 20, depending on the market you're in. And I think that's something people ought to think about. What's the right time frame and planning frame for them, for their business and the industry they're in? That's great. Yeah, let, me make, let me make one point clear, too. I think um, just because we talk about a three-year plan or a 20-year plan doesn't mean that you don't do it regularly. All that is is the planning horizon. So the planning process needs to go on constantly and continuously. My, my biggest client no longer holds planning meetings. They've gotten so good at, at, at getting away from event management and getting into everything they think about is how should we do this given the plan of attack we have. They almost don't even hold a planning session anymore. They just continually use a, a process for thinking and making better decisions. And that's an ideal ongoing planning process. That's great. Uh, another question that we have is, how would you change the process for self-employed or micro companies? Um, the process is the same. Uh, from my perspective, uh, there's no difference. I mean, you need all those components. Um, you know, they may not be as elaborate, uh, but they all need to be there. You need to have a, you know, a clear vision of where you want to go uh, with a plan followed by the right structure. Even if it's only one employee, <laughs> you, know, you need to make sure you have the right one and you need to have processes in place, and then you absolutely must have some form of control. In, so in most cases, people that are in that stage are already passionate. That's the reason that they started it. Yeah, and that's where I also add that board of advisors. That's why I said before you get started, put some people together that are going to help you think, and they can help you wander through those 23 steps with a purpose. But, you know, the problem I have when, as a sole entrepreneur starting a brand new business you're, you're excited, and you're excited about what's possible, and we also know you have an Excel spreadsheet, so you keep cranking out numbers so it looks good. The, the value of an outside group of people who are not vested in the business but just want to help you, and they're easy to find even at a micro stage, they're very simple to find, is they will help you think about the right way to do this for you. And I, I, can't, I can't say that enough. Get some advisors 
before you get going. That's the value of tech groups. I'm sure you can get through Kaufman and work with lots of peer groups, but get some peer groups together to help you do the right things for you, as Bill said. And if they ask how much the job pays, you've got the wrong person. <laughs> Um, Dave, I'm going to go back to one of the uh, one of the things you were just talking about related to advisors. One of our our next questions says, "What is the best method to identify people who have a genuine interest in your vision for your business?" First thing I would do is, you know, I guess it's a process I recommend. First and foremost, evaluate what your personal skills are. We all have holes, and we all have you know. But, Evaluate what your personal skills are. Then secondly, look at what you're trying to get done. And then that's, a, that's going to give you the gap. It's going to tell you what between what you're good at and what you're missing. That tells me who I should begin to look for. So if you're really a good finance person, you don't need a finance person. But you might need somebody who understands IT. Then just raise your hand, and there are tons of people out there. We have never had anyone turn us down about sitting on a board regardless of the stage of the business. So, you know, you, you look to, in your case, I'd look to Kaufman and say, okay, who, who can help me find the right person in my market? And, I, and I'm big on keep the people local uh, so that you can meet with them on a regular basis, have coffee with them, whatever it takes. But just raise your hand and say, I need help. I need to find somebody who's got good skills. If you're already employing professional services like an accountant or, or you have an insurance agent, they're a good source of people to go to to say, of your clients, who do you know who could help me? But don't put anybody you're paying a fee to on your board of advisors. But get, use them as a resource to find others. It's not, believe me, it sounds hard. It is not hard at all. I'll give you a 10-second story that I worked with a business in Toronto that he was looking for a board of advisors. He said he can't find anybody. He was in an office park near the Toronto airport. And we found five advisors, all of which could work, uh, could walk to his meeting. They were right there in the neighborhood. All they had to do was ask, and, and they're available to help. People want to give back. Um, kind of sticking with people, but now internally focused. The next question says, "Please speak about building culture and cultivating employees and relationships, with tying everything to measurable metrics and outcomes only. How do you keep it from becoming a culture when mistakes are not acceptable?" and people are afraid to say that they don't know. I'll let you take that one, Dave. You're an expert on culture. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, yeah. And I, and I, please, please don't read that I, when I talk about a culture, I'm not talking about a, a lockstep organization. I'm talking about a collaborative enterprise. I'm talking about an organization that in, in collectively sees how things should be done the right way. And so, but then they agree on the performance metrics. So. If I'm a salesperson and you want me to sell $100,000 in my territory and I only think I can sell 50, then we need to collaborate on what's the number we're going to be willing to hold each other accountable for. And then the culture I'm talking about is we agree to performance and we make it happen. It's a mutual agreement. It, it, is, not, it is not a lockstep organization. It is not designed to control you. It's actually designed to open you up and relieve you. We, we actually have a, product, a process we call the unit president concept which defines areas of freedom. And we think everybody in an organization ought to have an area of freedom. Why is it called unit president concept? Because presidents are free to do what they want to do. And we think that that's important to have at every job. Uh, but it, as with any company, there have to be some boundaries. But those are mutually agreed to boundaries. And that's what makes cultures work. Uh, sticking with culture, I have a, another big question on culture. And it says, what is your experience with operating in a corporate environment that is dominated by corporate politics? If the corporate culture is one that is mired in politics with sacred cows, and this starts at the top, the executive team and the board, do you have experience where employees in middle management can make significant change in such an environment? Or is there little to no hope for change if there's no awareness at the top of the need for change? I'll start with that one. I mean, coming out, come out of large corporate public companies, uh, cultures are more difficult to change in large corporations than they are in privately held businesses. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll use a prime example. Uh, General Motors, the typical CEO of General Motors lasts about five years. Uh, they got about 30 levels of an organization. 
if you're thinking about significant change in organizations that big, and you go back to the model we gave of one year per level of the enterprise, uh, very seldom will you get things to change in an enterprise as big as GM. Now, having said that, you can, whatever level you're at within a corporation, you can begin to bring better ideas and concepts up. The difference in a big company is you need them to find champions, people above you who will help carry the message. Because you're right, the, the, with a hierarchical structure in a big company, it's tough to get things done unless you can find champions. But I will tell you, it can be done. Uh, we made significant changes in the Borden company. Uh, a lot of the changes came with one of the companies I worked for, came out of mid-level organizational ideas because they kept putting good ideas with evidence in front of us. They kept putting compelling arguments in front of us. And then as you got to higher level, we don't want to look stupid either. So compelling arguments, well thought out, got heard. It just takes longer, to be honest. Yeah, let me piggyback on that. I, I agree 100%. Um, I was in a couple of large organizations myself. Um, what I found, though, and I still see this today, that there are subcultures within those cultures, and there are some uh, pretty acceptable subcultures that somehow figure out a way to operate uh, within the confines of uh, corporate policy. Um, if they don't, you know, probably people would do what I did, and that is they just decided to go do something different. You know, it's difficult to do. I had a hard time coming to that conclusion because I had a nice situation, but it just wasn't fun for me anymore, so I went someplace where I could create my own. And I eventually did the same thing. I, I was a CEO at the age of 29, a division CEO. By the time I was 44, I was done with the corporate life, and I went into my own businesses, bought my own company, started my own businesses. I'd had enough, and I, I think I thought I was good enough throughout pieces and parts to make things happen, and at some point it, it, it stopped being exciting and stop being rewarding and I thought there's got to be more life in this and I went to the private path which I've enjoyed a lot more. So um, thank you both. Uh, so several people have asked if, if the slides that you went through today will be available and I want to announce that yes in fact they will be available at fasttrack.org slash authors. There will also be a replay available of this entire webinar and we will send out an email to alert you when that's available. Uh, Bill and Dave, one last question, kind of tactically. How, how do you recommend people document their plans? Do you have a template? And if so, where can people download that? Um, or is there another uh, format that you recommend for people to document their work? Uh, yeah, I've got, first of all, let me, when I talk about a plan, let me, and I'm sure we have one in the wild uh, book, but when I talk about a plan, let me take a large corporation. We run a large, we do planning for a very large corporation. We run off a five-page plan. So the document that we look for is what we usually call a strategy statement that gets the core issues, the core challenges firmly articulated that everybody carries all the time. So we're talking a three to five-page plan. So I think we've got a couple of models we could upload that might be helpful to your audience. And Bill, you might want to add in there too. Yeah, and there's actually a sample plan in the book um, you can look at. It's, it's a very simplified version, but honestly, 90% uh, of the people need to start with a simplified version anyway because they have these large documents, if they have any at all, that sit on the shelf someplace and never get looked at. But these three, four, five-page documents have been very, very effective. And uh, we have another strategic planning guide um, that I could get to people, too. It's available on the website www.vowadvisors.com at no charge. So um, I'll I'll make sure that's up there. When we get off. Go back. I think it's on. There. And, and uh, additionally, I'd be I'd be happy to include that uh, in our archives, so we can make that available too. I want to thank you both. This has just been a terrific conversation. Appreciate both of your insight uh, and information. And for our Fast Track community, our listeners, thank you so much for joining us. It's just been a fantastic year of authors and learning together. This was our last webinar for the year. Uh, we will soon come out with our schedule for 2014 for our author series. And we're just delighted to have had so many people join us for these various sessions and look forward to getting back together with you in 2014. Everybody have a great day.